with us tonight? For the mic, I've got the list ready if you want to come on up. Good, okay. <laughs> Take the night off. It's good to have everyone with us. It's, uh, it's so wonderful to have the corners with us. They are so dear to us. Uh, it's so good to have them back with us. Uh, it's truly a pleasure. We wish we could do it more often. Uh, it's good to have our visitors with us, uh, whoever it may be today. Uh, please uh, understand one thing here at the congregation and the Freeport, the Church of Christ. Uh, we want to prove everything that we say. We, we would ask you, we would, uh, uh, we would uh, recommend that if you have any questions about anything you hear tonight that you ask us. Uh, when this lesson is over, is over with, I'll be in the back, and I would ask you to please let me know if you have any comments or any questions about anything you hear. And make sure you do something as we go through this lesson. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews, so if you want to go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 1, I would ask that everything that is said here tonight, I would ask that you prove me. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not in your spirit, but try the spirit for the be of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. See, you need to make sure that what I'm saying is what this book teaches. So make sure that everything that I say, you prove me. I'm going to do my very best to back everything up I say with scripture. And if I don't, you're more than welcome to call me on it. Because if any man speaks, he should be speaking as the oracles of God. Verse 3 4, and verse 11. Hebrews chapter 1. God, who sundry times and the night of his spake in times past unto the fathers, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself first our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by an inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels saith he at any time? Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to my father. And he will be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he said, Let all the angels of God worship him. But of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels a spirit and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. For thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness of all thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens of the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall wax old as doth the garment. And as the vesture shall thou shalt pull them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels saith he at any time, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstools? Are they not all ministering spirits? Sit forth and minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. Hebrews chapter 1. That is what we're studying tonight, the book of Hebrews. Tonight we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. The first two verses we covered last night, God would so three times. In various times and in various manners, he spake in times past unto the fathers through the prophets. We said that there were some times that God revealed things directly to man. If you look in Genesis chapter 20, for instance, you have God revealing something directly to Abimelech. If you see in Genesis chapter 16, God spoke directly to Hagar at the well, and he revealed something specifically to her. But by and large, when God dealt with man, he has dealt with man through the preaching of inspired men. He has dealt with man through prophets. So therefore, God at various times and in various ways spake in times passing to the fathers through the prophets. But hath in these last days spoken of us by his son. You have that it was given piecemeal then. It was revealed bit by bit. You had the prophets revealing certain things as it was revealed to them. But you have that contrasted with a total revelation of truth through Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 would say that we have all things that pertain to life and God. As the Lord was speaking to his apostles in John chapters 14 through 16, he would tell them that the Holy Spirit would tell them, teach them all things, John 14, 26. And that he would teach them all truth. John 16 and verse number 13. So we see that in the New Testament time, in contrast to the piecemeal, bit by bit revelation given through the prophets, the revelation given through Jesus was complete. Yeah. And total. And once for all, Jude, verse 3, delivered unto the saints. So we have God in sundry times and the divers of manners, speaking times passing to the fathers, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds. Jesus is the heir of all things, not only in the fact that he is creator of all things, he is sustainer of all things, and he is redeemer. When he hath by himself purged our sins, as we're going to see, he sat down with the majesty, the right hand of the majesty on high. So, as we introduce the book of Hebrews, we, we spoke two weeks ago about 
who we think was a human penman, and regardless, that is uh, mostly irrelevant because he didn't identify himself, and he did so for a reason. All glory goes to God, and we see that from the first word of the first chapter, God. We said that there was no salutation, there was no introduction. It goes right to the heart of the matter, God, and he speaks of that specifically. We just covered verse 1, and we covered verse 2, so let's look at verse 3. Follow along with me. Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and when he hath by himself purged our sin, and excuse me, and holding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The brightness of his glory. This is speaking of Jesus Christ. In Colossians 2 and verse 9, Paul would say that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Jesus was the personification of absolute holiness. That is deity. Jesus was the perfect glimpse of the Father. John 14 and verse number 9. That's what we'll look at in just a moment. The personification, the brightness of his glory. He is the personification of absolute holiness in word and deed. Because, folks, he lived on this earth and every day of his life he was perfect and sinless. Never once did he sin. Therefore, it is the blood of uh, of a pure lamb, that is without spot and without blemish, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. The true, uh, truly infinite deity is glorious, yet the man who was God was the perfect reflection of his Father while on earth. So if you saw Jesus, Philip, John 14, you saw the Father. Why? Because he reflected the Father. He was the personification of eternal deity. There was in no way that Christ behaved himself that was uh, contrary to what God has always been and will always be. Thus, the brightness of his glory. The express image of his person, just as we said in the last phrase, Jesus was the very expression of God, not his physical appearance. In Isaiah chapter 53, we see that there was the, he had the beauty in him that none would desire him, that he was actually a man of sorrows. That's not what is spoken about, not his physical appearance, but his actions was consistent with that of deity. His love, his compassion, his mercy, his justice, his righteousness, his holiness. His every action was in complete accordance with his own nature. Thus sinless perfection. He was upholding all things by the word of his power. Who's he? Who's he? Jesus. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is spoken of here for the same one that purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high upholds all things by the word of his power. Isn't it ugly to think that he that was on the cross was the creator of them who were reviling him and mocking him and had just scourged him. As they nailed him to the cross, Jesus knew, uh, could have known every thought that they were thinking. He knew every detail about them for he formed them. Jeremiah chapter 1 in the womb. Can you imagine uh, what a what a thought. The universe has order. The laws set forth by God in the very beginning are still in force. And the power behind it all is what? God. When he hath by himself purged our sins, Jesus died for us. Thus shedding his blood for the remission of sins. In Matthew 26 and verse number 28 he would say, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. For the remission of sins. That, what, that phrase, for the remission of sins, is the same phrase in Acts 2.38, by the way. For the remission of sins. Jesus shed his blood for, in order to obtain the remission of sins, and we repent and are baptized for, in order to obtain the remission of sins. What's the difference? Our friends would say that, well, he, uh, baptism uh, is a sign, an outward sign of an inward grace, and that you are baptized because you've been forgiven. Well, that, well if that's the case, then Jesus died because sins were already forgiven. Is that, is that accurate? Of course not. The blood of Christ goes the same direction as baptism because in baptism is where we can uh, contact the blood of Christ. Revelation 1 and verse number 5. He had purged our sins. He was buried and he rose from the dead for our justification. Romans 4 and verse 25. Notice the importance also of his resurrection. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. 1 Peter, 1, 3, uh, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. It says, A like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus. So we have the importance here of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. 
The question is, when did he purge our sins? When did he, uh, did he go back to heaven to make intercession for us? This is important. There are implications involved regarding the time frame that is spoken of here. For when he purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And the point I'm going to get, in, uh, get at here is it's, it's got a couple of facets here. Number one is there are some denominational folks who teach that uh, Jesus established the kingdom or he established the church because he failed to establish the kingdom. And the church was an afterthought. Well, folks, the kingdom is here today. In Colossians 1, verse 13, it says, Who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Brother Jerry mentioned this morning, this morning in the, the uh, James class that in Revelation chapter 1, uh, John speaks of in the present tense that he was a partaker in the kingdom. So we understand that the kingdom was there then. For when, uh, and what we're getting at here is that he became king the same time he became high priest. And if we don't think that there's a kingdom, guess what? He's not king. And if he's not king, he's not high priest. And if he's not high priest, you're in your sins. we got problems, don't we? We have to allow the Bible to interpret itself, don't we? We have to be reasonable about, uh, reasonable about this. In Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 17, it says this. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like his <coughs> brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now, either Jesus was high priest when this epistle was penned in the first century A.D., or he wasn't. Inspiration says he was high priest. Therefore, somebody's wrong. Somebody's wrong because somebody says that he doesn't have a kingdom and he's not reigning. But if he's not reigning, then he's not priest. Well, what do you mean, Eric? Well, give me a minute. We'll get to that. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest. Is that verse 2? We have. You know what future sense would be? We will have. 1 Peter 1 and verse 9, it says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Have we gotten to the end yet? Well, no, that's future. In Matthew 16, verse 19, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church. That's future. But now it says, we have such a high. That's present. We have. Who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the saints. You know what that means? That means he is ministering. For, he is our high priest. Wherefore, he is able to say to the uttermost those that draw nigh to God through him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them, Hebrews 7 and verse number 25. It is present tense, he is and has been high priest since Acts chapter 2, that's AD 30. The minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, not the, not the tent that was pitched by the sons of Kohath, Merari, and Gershon, not them, not even the temple built by Solomon. No, no, the true, the true tabernacle. This is that uh, that that was uh, uh, that was hewed out of the mountain without hands in Daniel chapter two. This is of divine origin. This is of man made. This is the the house of the living God. First Timothy three and verse fifteen. That is the church of Christ. Now notice that he is high priest in the new covenant. Was Jesus a high priest under the old law? Well, if you look at Hebrews chapter seven. Right around verse number 12 through 14, you'll see that, that if it was under the old law, Jesus couldn't be high priest because Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. He was even called the lion or the lamb. In Revelation, various chapters, chapter 7 and 14, of the tribe of Judah. But in Hebrews chapter 7, it mentions that he could not be a high priest under the law of Moses because in order to be a priest under the law of Moses, you had to be a son of who? Levi. You had to be uh, the, the son of Aaron, the, the, the Levitical priesthood. But he's not under the old covenant. He lived under the old covenant. But his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the events of Acts 2 ushered in a what? A new covenant. Now the God of peace that brought again the dead, uh, from the dead the Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now which covenant is that? Is the blood of the everlasting covenant, the blood that was uh, shed from the veins of bulls and goats that Moses sprinkled with hyssop? And he 
he's bringing on the book and the people back and the old, no, no, no. See, that was, that was the blood of animals he first did. This is the blood of Christ. This is the blood of Jesus, the Son of God. This is the blood of the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the everlasting covenant is the new covenant, not the old covenant. Make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. Hebrews 12, 21. But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with him, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he made the old, uh, he made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away now. Now let me make sure we understand something. Hebrews chapter 8 quotes from Jeremiah 31. And when he said it is nigh unto vanishing away, he's still quoting from Jeremiah 31. He isn't saying that in the first century it hadn't passed away yet because guess what? It had. You are dead to the law by the body of Christ, Romans 7 4. You're dead to that law, Romans 7 6. Continue to notice when. This is important. When did Jesus become high priest? Remember I said a moment ago that he would be king and priest? I'm going to back it up. Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 13. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and he shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be priest upon his throne. He is ruling as king, and he is priest. Can he be king without being priest? Can he be priest without being king? Therefore we understand that when he began to reign, he began to be what? Priest. Isn't that simple? When did this happen? Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, that's speaking of David, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He's seen this before. What does it mean? You mean he, raised, he rose up Jesus, sit on his throne? Well, I think it, no, 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 stop. Stop right there. Don't tell me what you think. Listen to what God says. He tells you what it means. What does it mean that when Jesus would sit on the throne of David? What does it mean? Listen, this, he's seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. Now, isn't that simple? Isn't it easy to allow the Bible to tell us what it means? That his soul was not left in Hades, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which now ye see in you. What did they see in here? They saw and heard the tongues in Acts chapter 2, the beginning of that, right? That's what they saw. That was the Holy Ghost falling upon them, confirming that the message was from God. This was with the message of the kingdom would go forth in all of these various countries, these people, they all heard it in their own language. Power from high, Acts 1 and verse 5, a reference back to Matthew 3, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's not for you, that was for them. For similar language that speaks of the same concept of Jesus being exalted when he ascended back to the Father, notice in chapter 4 and verse 14, passed into the heavens. In chapter 6 and verse 20, he is the forerunner into heaven. For Christ is not entered unto the holy place made with hands, which are the fingers of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us Hebrews 9 and 24. You remember in the tabernacle, in the, in the tabernacle of the Old Testament, you had a division. You had a veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And this veil had cherubs. And this holy place was where the priest would come. But the most holy place, there was only one man that could go in there. And he could only do it once a year. And he had to offer blood for himself first. Before he went in there. That was a foreshadow of what Jesus would do, to, do for us. 
In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 51, as he was hanging on the cross, and it says the veil of the temple ran from top to bottom, that was signifying that the separation between God and man was taken away in the death of Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, this holy place, which represented heaven, is now accessible for all men through whom? Through Jesus. Mm -hmm. But this man, because he continueth forever, Jesus, hath an unchangeable priesthood, Wherefore he is able to, uh, also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered himself. Jesus offered himself without blemish and without spot, and this was one sacrifice for all time. That's the power of this sinless sacrifice. Jesus became our high priest when? When he ascended back to the cross. Not in AD 70, as some of these foolish people are talking about. It should also be emphasized and encouraging that Jesus is able to absolutely remove, purge, expiate, to abolish the power or guilt of, to make amends for or to purify our sin. So the question is, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1, uh, Colossians 2 and verse 10, excuse me, they were either complete in Christ or they weren't. They were either forgiven of all trespasses, Colossians 2 13, or they weren't. They were either forgiven of all sins, Acts 2 and verse 38, or they weren't. Paul either had all of his sins washed away, Acts 22 16, or he didn't, which is Can we today also confidently say the same thing? Folks, if you do what the Bible tells you to do, you can know that you can receive the same blessings. But look, guess what? You have to do it God's way. You can't do it your way. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, isn't that reassuring? Verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. <clears throat> now, how do we reconcile this in Hebrews 2 and verse 9? Hebrews 2 and verse 9 says that he was made a little lower than the angels, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. How do we reconcile that he has been made so much better than the angels and that he was also made lower than the angels? Well, how do we understand it? Well, there are some who cry a contradiction every time they see something that they perceive to be a contradiction, but guess what? It doesn't make it so. Mm -hmm. It has to be understood in the light of its context. How can we reconcile this? Well, I think it's easily enough. Jesus took the form of man. If, if he was made in the image of men and he became a man, he was made Lord of the angels. He was made Lord of the angels for one reason, that he would live and die for us. But also in living for us, and, and have you ever thought of that? Not only did he die for you, but he lived for you. Every day he went out of this world and he did face temptation. And guess what? Every day he remained sinless just so he could die for you. In doing this, he obtained a more excellent name than they. Thus he was made lower and exalted higher. Philippians chapter 2, beginning verse 5. <clears throat> Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but empty himself, taking the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he became obedient, even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. Wherefore also, what is wherefore man? Pay attention to what was just said. He was made in the image of man, and he became obedient even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him. Why? Because he died for him. Thus, he was made lower than the angels as a human being to taste death, but he was exalted higher than the angels because of his absolute perfection and submission to the Father in redeeming man. That in the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow of things in the heaven, and of things on the earth, and of things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. He was made so much better than the angels, and that his perfect obedience made him the only one that could purge the sins of man. Thus he earned himself such glory and honor. 
by an inheritance. I believe that this by an inheritance deals more so with this reference as we've just spoken of. Something that what we're speaking about here is his preeminence as creator. Now, there's no doubt that that, that is true, that he is preeminent and he is the creator. But I think that speaking of this inheritance speaks of him uh, as his role that redeemed. More so than creator. This, I believe, has reference more to his submission and sacrifice than his authority and preeminence. Since the result of his actions gave him a more excellent name. What actions? Perfect uh, perfection and this perfect sacrifice to redeem man. We see that being made so much better than the angels is connected de uh, directly to as he hath by an inheritance obtained. Now notice, Hebrews 2, 7 through 10. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou didst put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he subjected all things unto him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we see not yet all things subjected to him. But now, uh, but we behold him, who hath been made a little lower than the angels, even Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and uh, through whom are all things, and bringing many sons into glory, to make the author of their salvation. Perfect through sufferings. Lower than the angels. Exalted higher than the angels. No contradiction. The only way in which Jesus was made, period, is in human form. Because Jesus is eternal deity. Jesus is the I am, John 8 and verse 58. Jesus is the eternal God. So we understand that the only way in which he was made was when he took the form of a mortal being made under the law, Galatians 4 verse 4. So we understand this phrase being connected to his duty and sacrifice that was destined from eternity. And it was destined from eternity, by the way. Revelation 13 verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Isn't it sad that folks would say, well, when God created man, he put him in the garden. He had no idea that he was ever going to sin. And once he sinned, he really had to scurry about it and try to figure something out. No, no, folks, you see, in Ephesians 3, verse 11, it speaks about the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ. Jesus Christ was from eternity purposed to be man's redeemer. Therefore, God understood from eternity that man was going to need redeemed. Therefore, God understood that from eternity man was going to sin. And so we have this perfect plan for man to be justified by Jesus Christ and his perfect sacrifice. He was given a more excellent name than that. This speaks of his glorification again. How? There is no comparison between a created being and deity. But a more excellent name was given to Jesus for his role as redeemer of man. Notice again in Hebrews 1, 5 through 6. For unto which of the angels saith he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I begot thee. And again I'll be to my father, and I'll be to me a son. And when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. Continue to notice. The Son of God is higher and more exalted because he took the form of man. Now, here's what I'm trying to emphasize. It's obvious that deity is greater than any created being anyway. But there's another way in which Jesus was exalted. And again, that is his role as Redeemer. This phrase has to be understood in the context of Jesus being made and by an inheritance obtaining. Again, that is in reference to his actions as a redeemer. This is because his perfect submission made him the only candidate to do so. In Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 14, For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, and things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. He is the perfect high priest. First Timothy 2 and verse 5. There's one mediator between God and man, the man of Christ Jesus. Have you ever thought about what he gave up for you? Philippians 2 is, is more than just, well, <clears throat> eternal deity took the form of man. It was purpose from eternity that someone was going to fulfill that role. Now, don't ask me how because I, weren't, I wasn't there when this was decided. But I do know that God the Father has a specific role. And God the Son has a, a, a very specific role. And, and God the Holy Spirit has a very specific role. 
And God the Son was destined from eternity to take the, the form of man, to be made in the image of man, and come and die for man. That was his purpose from eternity. He is redeemer. The Holy Spirit, likewise, was destined from eternity to reveal this truth to man. And he did so in the first century, once for all. Have you ever thought about what he gave up for you? He counted not the being on equality with God a thing to be grasped that empty himself. He didn't empty himself of deity, but he willingly submitted to the Father. And he willingly submitted even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. Isn't that something? And in all of this, in some way, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, there is a remnant. There are some remnants of humanity in Christ even now. It says the man, Christ Jesus, he is our interceder. The word better is used 12 times in the book of Hebrews. More than any other book in the New Testament. More than any other book in the New Testament by far. I think the closest is still single digits. Great emphasis on the superiority of Jesus and his covenant to the law of Moses. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. The superiority of Jesus, of his covenant, of his sacrifice, of his blood, of his priesthood. To that of the law of Moses. What a wonderful study. And I pray that it's going to be beneficial to us all as we continue. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here tonight that have never obeyed the gospel? If you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, listen to what the Bible says. And to you who are weary, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. If you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, what is your eternal destiny? Everlasting destruction. What if you said, well, I don't know if I've obeyed the gospel of Christ. Well, we'll make it very simple for you. The Bible teaches that in order to obey the gospel, you must first hear the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 8 says, it is the word of faith. Verse 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It is the substance upon which faith is built. You must hear the word of God, and you must believe it. John 6 and verse 29, it is a work to believe in Christ, and you believe in Christ through his word, John 5, 39. You must repent of your sins. Why? Because your faith being produced by this word leads you to the conclusion that you need to repent of your sins. You must believe this word, and it ought to cause you to recognize your poor spiritual condition, Matthew 5, verse 3. Repentance is a change in mind that leads to change in actions. Acts 26 and verse 20. Acts 17, verse 30, all men are commanded everywhere to repent. That means you. That means now. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ before men. This is the good confession. Romans 10, verse 10, and it's made with your mouth, and it goes unto, towards salvation. But even under this point, you've not been forgiven. Even under this point, you've not been a recipient of one spiritual blessing. You must be baptized for the remission of sins. This isn't a baptism of the Holy Ghost. That was a promise, not a command, and it wasn't for you. This is simply being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You might say, well, what does water have to do with being forgiven? Well, what did water have to do with cleansing Naaman of leprosy, 2 Kings chapter 5? What did water have to do with cleansing the blind man's ailments in John chapter 9? Water has everything to do with it when God says it does, 1 Peter 3, 21. Won't you be baptized for the remission of sins? Such a simple command, but it's an act of faith and it's a test, isn't it? You must, you must do so. They were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. In Acts 2.38, 2, verse 41 says, And they that gladly received their word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. What were they added to? Verse 47 says they were added to the church. The saved were added to the church. The saved are in the church, and the church are the saved. Are you, are you saved outside the church? Not in the Bible, you're not. When you obey the gospel of Christ, he adds you to his church. Ephesians 3, and verse 6. Where you now are recipient of all spiritual blessings, including having your sins washed away. You must then be faithful even unto the end, even if it costs you your life. Revelation 2.10. For those who have obeyed the gospel, have you been faithful? Is there something in your life that will keep you from heaven? Are you engaging in some sinful activity that you know you ought not to? Won't you examine yourselves? We're going to sing an invitation song as we do. Consider your condition. If there's something that needs to be made right, we would allow you to come forward and acknowledge your sins. We'll pray for you. We'll pray with you. If you need to be baptized into Christ, we'll do that. We'd be happy to help. Consider your condition tonight. This might be your last year. The invitation is yours. Please come down as we stand. Oh, do not let the word depart.